Hi, this is Topher with OS Training. In this series, we're going to cover what used to be known as Google Webmaster Tools. They recently changed the name, however, so the new name of Google Webmaster Tools is Google Search Console. I'm going to log in real quick and we'll take a look at some things before we get started. The first thing I'd like to talk about is the purpose of Google Search Console. Before we had Google Search Console, if you wanted to be listed with Google, you would put up a website and hope that they found you. And they would find you if other people linked to your website, because that's how Google Search works. It crawls the web, going from link to link and finding new websites. If no one ever linked to your site, Google would never find you. With the Search Console, you can communicate directly with Google. And you can say, look, here is my site. Please crawl it. And when you get new content, you can alert Google that you have that new content immediately, rather than waiting for the next crawl, which could be days or weeks. You can pull together a site map and tell them up front all at once, here are all my pages. Please crawl them all. You can get very specific about what pages to not crawl without having to resort to a robots.txt file. You can tell Google that two different pages that have the same content are actually intended to be the same page. They can simply be accessed with two different URLs. In exchange for telling Google all of this information, Google will tell you many things as well. They will tell you about errors that they find when crawling your site. They will make suggestions on how to make your site more accessible, both to Google and to humans who might have special needs. I logged in here, and you can see that I have a number of sites listed. These are not all my sites. It's possible for the owner of the site to give access to a Google account so that they can work on Google Search Console, even though they're not the owner. As a web developer, there are a number of organizations that have given me access to their search consoles. So when you first log in, you probably won't see a bunch of sites here like I have. But at some point, you may end up with it. Regardless, you probably have a big red Add Property button. Let's click that and show how to add one. Right here, you enter the URL of a property you would like to manage. This is just a site that I experiment on. There's nothing significant there. Now I hit continue. And now what needs to happen is I need to verify that I own this site. I could have put anything in there. I could have put in yahoo.com. But without this verification step, then I can't prove that I own that site. And there are two ways. The first is the recommended method and that's to download a small HTML file and put it on the site and then visit that file in the browser. That proves to them that I have access to put files on the site. There are alternate methods though. One is to add a meta tag to my site's homepage. Edit the HTML of, of the homepage itself actually. Another is to sign into my domain name provider Another is to use Google Analytics. And lastly, use your Google Tag Manager account. For a real site that I've already set up analytics on, I have found the Google Analytics method to be the easiest because I'm already logged into that account anyway. And I don't have to do anything at all. It just works. So if you already have a site running analytics and you're logged into analytics on that account already, use this method. It's very, very fast and easy but I'm going to do the recommended method. So I'm going to download this file and there you can see now it's downloaded and then I'm going to upload it to here. You can upload it with any tool you wish. There, now I have uploaded that file and I will open this in a new tab 
and you can see the contents of that file. And then I can click Verify. Congratulations, you have successfully verified your ownership. Continue. And here I am looking at the dashboard of the Search Console for that site, and it's completely empty. Throughout this series, we're going to take a look at the console through the lens of several different sites. The reality is, every single site is going to have a different looking Search Console because it has different kinds of content, and Google will interact with it in a different way. So we're going to look at a relatively new site, a relatively old site, and a site that's actually been hacked at some point. So follow along and I'll do my best to show you everything that Google Search Console can do. In this video, we're going to take a look a little bit here at the home page of the Search Console, and then we're going to move on to the various settings that you can use. The home page isn't worth a whole lot in my opinion. It's nice to see there are no errors, and it's nice to see the sitemap here. But there's so much more information behind all of these things as to make these almost worthless. For example, if we click Search Analytics, we'll take a look at this later, but we can add impressions, click-through rate, and position, and down here all of this extra information comes in. And we want to know all that information. Number of total clicks alone doesn't really tell us much at all. And the sitemap isn't really going to change that much, so you don't really need to be looking here. So later I'll show you how to get to the really good stuff that's in deeper. But first, let's look at the settings. This is the search console for my own blog. Since I am full owner, I have all of these settings. This is the search console for my friend's blog and he gave me access so that I can view some information. But you can see here my settings are far fewer. So let's go back to one that we actually own because that's probably what you're going to be working on. We have Search Console Preferences. Messages are just emails from Google and you can choose what language you want them in. And then you can choose whether or not you want email notifications and if so, about what? This is actually pretty great because top issues, critical issues like malware that need attention now, you'll get an email as soon as Google finds malware on your site. Not three weeks later when a client calls you and says, why does it say your site is a dangerous site on Google search results? The next one is called Site Settings. And here you can choose whether you prefer www or not www, or to leave it so that both work. Then you can choose a crawl rate. It's possible for Google to crawl your site too often or too fast and hurt your server so that it feels like it's under attack. That makes it so that real users can't actually get there. So you can choose to let Google optimize for your site, which is actually pretty good. Most times it's okay. Or deliberately limit Google's maximum crawl rate. If it's been a problem for you, go ahead and limit it. It's not that big a deal. Then we have change of address, which is interesting because you can do more than that with this. If you're actually changing the URL of your website, this is where you would do it. For example, my site is tofer1kenobi.com. If I wanted to put it at derosia.com, which is my last name, then I could do that here and I would not lose all my data. And it would notify Google that it's the same site. Otherwise, they would view it as a new site and I would lose lots and lots of Google juice, which is a slang term for how high Google ranks you in their search results. But there's a key tool here that I want to tell you about. And right here it says, if you don't see your site, add it now. I do see my site, but I want to click add it now because what this does is allow me to add variants. For example, I have http colon slash slash tofer1kenobi.com and that's the default for this. But I also have https and www and https www. Now these are verified and I can view the verification details. This one is not verified. 
So I can click verify this property. And it failed because I took the file down after verifying HTTPS, which is just fine for now. So I'm going to leave it. But I brought you here because it's important to know that if you have HTTP and HTTPS, Google sees them as different sites. And you can come in here and tell Google, no, they're the same site. And then your stats get merged together. They don't hit you for having duplicate content. And all kinds of good things happen when you tell Google that they're actually the same site. So we got there by going to change of address and then add it now. The rest of this form is if you are actually changing your address. Then we have Google Analytics property and you can enable Search Console data in Google Analytics. These are some other sites that I own and I don't want them linked. They're different sites altogether. And I initially verified my own site with Google Analytics, so it's already tied. But if you had not tied them together yet, this is where you could do it simply by choosing your site and clicking Save. Here's where you can set who can do what in your account. Right now, there's just me as the owner. I can add a new user and just put in their Google email address and what they're allowed to do, restricted or full. And then you can manage property owners. This one says it's already verified with Google Analytics. It was verified by me. And here I can add an owner. And I can actually unverify this user with this account. Don't do that if it's you, because then you won't be able to get back to your account. And that would be sad. The next thing we're going to look at is verification details. Now we've seen this already in a number of different places. And it's actually the same page. They all link to this particular one. But here you can verify using a different method. And they actually recommend verifying using multiple methods. That way if one of them breaks, for example, if your meta header disappeared or something, then the others would still work. But here you can click and get verification details. And here we have associates. These are associated users. You can add a new user and it just gives them login access to your stats, similar to being another owner. Next to Site Settings, we have the Help tab, which offers different help based on what page you're visiting. So you'll get different things based on where you are. So don't be afraid to click it and see what's available to you on each page. If you are the owner of multiple sites, you'll see a drop-down list like this. And you can see which ones you have access to. In our next video, we'll start looking at the data that Google offers and what it can teach us. In this video, we're going to take a look at your search appearance. And to know what we're talking about, it's as easy as clicking on this eye right here. And this is our search appearance. This is your title in the results of a Google search. This right here is a snippet. And here we have some site links. And then a search within a site. Right here is your URL. If you're doing an event, here's a rich snippet. Here's some breadcrumbs. And if you have a product, here's a rich snippet. We'll look at how to make some of these things, as well as what Google has to say about it. Here we're looking at structured data. To explain what structured data is, we're going to go to this page right here, which is on developers.google.com. And it's basically adding a few special tags to your HTML. Nothing fancy, nothing difficult. Here's an example of some HTML without those special tags. We have Pizza My Heart, 88% like it, CL12 reviews, it's a link under $10 per entree. Down here is some HTML extended with a format called microformats. And we give a class of hreview-aggregate, which says this whole thing is a review. Then we have a class here, of vcard, and we're saying it's an item. For the title, we add fn. Around the percentage, we have 
rating average. And then we have a class of count around how many reviews there are. And then we have price range. Google can read all of these micro formats and render different things on the search results page and can make it much more attractive to people who are looking you up. A little further down the page here, you can see that we can use meta tags to supply some extra information. For example, pub date and there's a date when it was created. Then Google knows how old it is. Here are some meta tags that Google actually excludes. There's an excellent section on rich snippets and that's how to make this kind of thing. Rather than just pulling the first 85 characters from your page or blog post or whatever, you can determine what gets put there. And here's some excellent information on how to use microformats. None of this is required. You don't have to do it. It won't necessarily impact your Google ranking, but it does make it much more visually interesting to the end user, and they're far more likely to click on you as opposed to the other ones. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, I strongly recommend you read up on rich snippets, structured data, etc. There are far more pages than just this one on how to do it. Simply search for HTML structured data and you'll find dozens and dozens of tutorials on how to do it. Another option if you're using a CMS is to get a theme that's already marked up properly. If they do it, then they're sure to say it because it's a pretty cool thing to add to your theme. We're looking at my page here, and it says there are 885 items on 197 pages, with 760 items having errors. Now, I didn't put any effort into it myself. My theme does it automatically. And so apparently they've done some things that Google considers to be an error. The next option we have here is the data highlighter. I haven't highlighted anything. But I wanted to come to this page because this is an excellent example of how Google really wants to educate you. This is something I'm not using at all. And so instead of just simply saying, we don't have any data, they provide a tutorial video on how to use it. And down here, they give screenshots on how to use it. And then a link to start doing it immediately. This is one of the things I love about Google Search Console. Google has put a great deal of effort into teaching you how to use it. So if there's something you're not using at all, they will show you. Next is HTML improvements. I have no data available. and Let's click why not. And in actuality, the reason this time is because I only told Google Search Console about my site four days ago, and it has not had time to gather that information. However, one of the reasons they offer is that perhaps you have both www and not www, and Google might be looking at only one of them. In our video on the settings, I showed you how to tell Google that we have both, and that can help get rid of that error. Let's take a look at HTML improvements on a site that's been around for a while. Here it's reporting that we have zero duplicate meta descriptions, which is great you don't want to have more than one. We have zero long meta descriptions. That could be good or bad. You might want a long description. And then we have two short meta descriptions. We'll look at those in a sec. And then we have title tag. We didn't detect any issues with the title tags on your site, and we didn't detect any issues with non-indexable content on your site. So let's click here. And these are the short meta descriptions that were created for these pages. So let's go back to my blog, and eventually Google will know more information about my site when it finishes crawling it fully. And here we have site links. It says site links are automatically generated links. 
that may appear under your site's search results. So those would be here. So I could say, when you go to the home page, I also want you to be able to see my contact page or my about page or my purchase page or things like that. This is where you can tell Google, here's what I would like to appear there. Here is where you can say, please do not ever put this page as a site link on a search result page. And there could be any number of reasons for that. So that's it for search appearance. You have quite a bit of flexibility, but at the end of the day, it is entirely at Google's discretion. They don't have to use your site links that you specified on this page. They don't have to use your snippet. If for some reason it doesn't work right or there's a problem or somebody at Google simply reads it and finds it inappropriate or offensive, then they'll just use something else. That is pretty rare though. And so I strongly recommend that you go through here and you create your structured data properly and you use the data highlighter and you put in some site links. It'll make your search results much more attractive to the end user. In this video, we're going to take a look at some search traffic data. You can get there through one of two ways. The first is by clicking search analytics here. And that takes us, as you can see, to search analytics under search traffic. Now, as I mentioned, I only set this up on my site about four days ago, and so my search traffic is pretty pathetic. I've had 17 clicks. And down here, you can see what they clicked on. And I'm pretty nerdy, so there's a lot of Linux stuff here. But not all of it. Now you can see I have some things listed here that have zero for clicks. So why are they there? In actuality, what we want to do is turn on all of these things. So here we have clicks, impressions, click-through rate, and position. So now we can see clicks, impressions, click-through rate, and position. So all of these that had zero for clicks still got impressions. Now an impression is when your page turns up in a search result page, but they don't click on it. They just saw your title and moved on and chose someone else's page. Generally, that's not that great. But if you've done a great job with structured data, and you have good rich snippets out there, impressions can be valuable too. Just like logos and branding, people get your name in their head and they may come back. Here we have click-through rate. This is a ratio of the number of impressions to clicks. For example, for my top one, I have 10 impressions and two clicks. So that's a 20% click-through rate. For silent printing Firefox, I have one click and one impression, so it's 100%. That's particularly impressive because on the search results page, it was 11th, which means it was on page two of Google's search results. And it's actually pretty rare for people to go past page one. But here you can see this one was in the fourth position, 3.6. 5.8. Now, these have fractions because there are multiple impressions. It turned up in different positions in different times. Sometimes it was 6, sometimes it was 5, etc. Here's one where I was in position 89.5. I'm impressed that anyone got down there. Here's 195. Now we can click over here and get a bit more information about only that query. Let's take a look at this page for another site. Now this is my friend's site, Nomad Together. He and his wife and their brood of young children are traveling America in a camper. So they're nomads together and they blog from the road. I'm going to turn on all of his impressions, click-through rate and position. And here you can see he has much more traffic than I do, but he's been running Search Console for much longer than I have. 
This is a more realistic looking page with more realistic looking data. Now there are some other things we can look at here. We've been only looking at queries, searches for our site. We can look at pages also. So this is actual individual pages rather than keywords. So his homepage had 101 clicks and 291 impressions. Then we can look at countries. And obviously most of his traffic is coming from the United States. But France and Germany represent pretty well also. That could be because in past years he and his family were nomads in Europe. And they probably have friends there. But you can go down and down and down and you can see which countries are looking at his site, basically. You can also filter by devices. It's desktop, mobile, and tablet. If we go to tablet, you can see total clicks, total impressions, click-through rate, average position, etc. Then there's search type. And you can search by web, image, or video. He has no image clicks and no video clicks. You can also filter by date. Right now it's July 3 through July 30. And there's nothing there. Now this is really only useful if your site has date structured URLs, like a blog or something and his does not, so we get no results. Up at the top here you can go back to the old search queries report. Now if you're watching this because you've never used this tool then you're probably not going to have a preference. But if you used Google Webmaster Tools long ago you may recall this page and like it better. And it's still here and you can use it. Let's look at links to your site. Now this is still Nomad Together. He has links from homealongtheway.com, quora.com, daddrepreneur.com, nodesk.co, homevertex.com, etc. Now he owns Home Along the Way as well as Nomad Together. And that's why they have so many links back and forth to each other. Now something interesting also about Nomad Together is several months ago he got hacked. And the hackers put in many, many pages and links to things like casinos. And you can see there's no preview available because that page doesn't exist anymore. That's actually why there are 5,500 links. Because that's how many pages the hackers made. After he cleaned it up, he got back down to about 30. But Google remembers. And if you have about 30, and you're browsing through here, and one day you notice you have 5,500, you should start looking for a hack on your site as well. Internal links are links within your own site. These are actually pretty important. Google really likes links inside of websites. Now again, because he was hacked, the numbers are very, very high. Let's take a look at my site, and we have none because it's too new. But eventually, Google will continue to crawl my site and will find all of the links internally. Here we have manual actions. My site has none, and his site has none. And actually, I've never seen any. And Google has not provided documentation for us in this page like they have for all the other pages. So honestly, manual actions remain a mystery to me. The next thing we're going to look at is international targeting. I've never seen this used either, but then I have never intentionally targeted a specific area of the world. But this is where you would do it. You would say, my site is specifically about France, or my site is specifically in Arabic. And that helps Google know to whom to push ranking higher. For example, if it's specifically about France, you're going to rank higher in France. If it's specifically in Arabic, it's going to rank higher for anyone using an Arabic browser. 
And lastly, we have mobile usability. Google's not yet finished processing my site. It's too new. But over here, we can see that there are zero pages with errors. They went through his site looking for problems with mobile devices, and they did not find any. That's because he purchased a WordPress theme specifically built to work with mobile. But here we have a learn more option. And there's some excellent documentation about how to make your page mobile friendly. That's particularly important because recently Google announced that mobile friendly sites would get higher rankings in search results. So if you really care about high rankings in search results, take some time to make sure your site is mobile friendly. In this video, we're going to take a look at how Google has indexed your site. Before we get over there, I'd like to point out here that Google has indexed 1,365 URLs on my website. But if I go to Google Index and go to Index Status, it says zero total indexed. That can happen for a variety of reasons, but this reason is that my site is so new to Google Search Console. It has read through all those links, but it has not sorted them and categorized them, organized them, and given them ranking. So we're going to skip over here to the Nomad Together site. And you can see that he has 4,533 total indexed. Now what's interesting is that he had zero until January of 2015, which is when he put the site up. Then he had four then 7 and 16 because he made some pages and posts and then down to 12 and then 13 and suddenly he had a thousand right there is where he got hacked on April 12th 2015 and zoop there it went and then they just left it alone for a while and they realized that he hadn't noticed yet and zoop up to 5183 and then he started deleting them because he figured out what's going on. So he doesn't have those anymore. If we go to advanced, we can also look at total indexed and blocked by robots. Blocked by robots are URLs Google could not access because they are blocked by a robots.txt file. That would be his WordPress admin area. You can also choose to see removed Now if we go over here to content keywords, you can see the keywords that people used to find his site. Some of them are legitimate. Nomad together, family, things like that, school, but then many of them are left over from when he got hacked. Let's take a look at a different site that hasn't been hacked and has more realistic content keywords. Going to choose Access of West Michigan, and they provide services to people who are low on cash. So their index status, they have 688 pages. Most of those are blog posts. You can see they had a dip there. But then their content keywords, and this is great. West, because they're in West Michigan, Michigan. Food, hunger, pantry, community, poverty, grand, congregation, blog. They do walks, donation, families. This is perfect. This shows exactly the kind of things that we want people to search for to find Access of West Michigan. Now if we click on one, you can see where they got using that one. Most of these are blog posts or archives. But if we look for hunger, you can see they have the hunger walk and the community and all kinds of documents on how to get help. This is a great example of content keywords being used properly. Let's look at blocked resources. I doubt I'm going to find any on any of the sites that I manage. Ah. Nomad Together. 
he has one. And that would be his WP admin. It's blocked in robots.txt. And I don't have any on my site. But a blocked resource is anything that you tell Google, I don't want this crawled. I don't want you to find it. I don't want you to tell anybody about it. Please just leave it alone. Not all search engines respect that kind of command in your robots file, but Google does. And if you make a listing in robots.txt, it will not be crawled, and it will be listed on this page to acknowledge that they are ignoring it. And here you can remove URLs. So if something gets crawled, and you did not want it to, but you forgot to put it in robots.txt, you go ahead and put it in robots, and then you come back here and you say, please take out this page. I need that to not be in our search results. I've seen it happen in a couple of occasions, but it's pretty rare. If you need to, this is where you do it. In this video, we're going to take a look at the crawl area of the search console. It's called a crawl because Google acts like a spider crawling all over the web looking at every link. It's kind of a throwback to the days when all search engines were called spiders. The first thing we see here at the top is that our DNS is good, our server connectivity is good, and our robots.txt fetch is good. Then down below we see URL errors, and I have one. They couldn't get at Molly's BOA, and the response code was 500. Looking at these errors is actually pretty important. It can tell you things about your server, and it can tell you things about your own site. I'm going to try to look at Molly's BOA. First we'll load it in our own browser, and it works. Now we can fetch it as Google, and it works. So now we can mark it as fixed, and now it is gone. It still shows that it happened, but it's not listed here anymore. Now if we go to another site, the Nomad Together site, you can see there are four server errors with 500. No soft 404s, which means the target doesn't exist, but the server is not returning 404. And 1,980 not founds. These are all the hack pages that he removed. And then here are two that are not followed. And the response code is 302. Now because his site's been around for a little while longer, there are smartphone and feature phone options as well. And then this is the access site, the one working with poverty in West Michigan. You can see here that they had 12 errors in May, but then they dropped right off. The problems were not founds. And if we look here, we can kind of deduce that they're actually just bad links. They missed the HTTP or something like that. Now I mentioned to know that it's important to know what the response codes mean. I did a little search for HTTP error codes and it brought me to the w3.org page. All 400 level errors are client errors, which means your browser had a problem. 400 is bad requests. 401 is authorized, meaning you don't have a password for this area. 402, payment required, and you'll never see it because it's reserved. 403 is forbidden. 404, not found, is one of the most famous error codes. But there are many others. Five hundred level errors means the server did something wrong. And just plain 500 is the most common 500 level error, internal server error. That's what mine was with Molly's BOA. And in actuality, what happened was that it timed out. My server was under heavy load at the time, 
and it served something that was not the web page, but it wasn't exactly nothing either. So it got a 500 server error. But there are many other 500s as well. So if you start seeing 500 level errors in your site, then you should start looking at your server to see if there's something wrong with it. Now, they only have four here, and they were all pretty much on the same day. So, similar to my site, there could have been simply just something wrong with the server right then. If you suddenly find 1980 not founds, then you need to start looking at your site to see if it's been hacked and see what's going on there. Next, let's take a look at crawl stats. Pages crawled per day. The average is 207, the low is 21, but the high was 2483. And that was back when he got hacked. Kilobytes downloaded per day. If your server charges you by data sent out, then this matters to you. If Google is sucking up all your bandwidth, then you might need to think about how you're managing Google's crawl rate. And then time spent in downloading a page. This can tell you if your site is getting slow, if your server is serving things slowly. The access site has a high of 260 pages because they've never been hacked. And my own site has a high of 1,229 because it's a blog that's been around a long time and I actually have about that many posts. But this is per day. The average is 256, which means they don't crawl my whole site every day. They just crawl a part of it. You can see here before June, they downloaded much more data per day. And on this day, it took a really long time to download it. This information independently isn't super useful, but put together, it can help you understand what's going on with your server. It can help you know if it's struggling or not. And it can help you know about how long it might be before Google finds the new page that you put up. The next thing we're gonna look at under crawl is fetch as Google which means go get a web page as if the browser were Google. And you would do this if you had some question as to whether or not Google was actually accessing a given page on your site. You can put in any sub page of your site or you can just leave it blank and hit fetch. There, it's complete. And now I have the option to submit it to the index. I'm not going to because I actually already did that on the 29th of July. But if you had a page that was not being found by Google, no matter what you did, but Fetch found it, here you could submit it to Index and say, look, here is this page, make it work. You also have the option to Fetch and Render to see what Google is going to see. So let's do that. This time it took a little extra time and it was only able to get a partial. So this is how Googlebot saw the page, and this is how a visitor would have seen the page. They're exactly the same, which is great. Now it said partial, and here are some things that it couldn't get. There's an image. And there's jQuery. Now if I go back and I click on the one where I did not ask for a render, it simply says complete, and it shows me the code. We can also choose to see what the site's going to look like on a smartphone. Again, only a partial. That tells me my server is laboring. But this is how Google sees my site on mobile. And how a visitor would have seen it. There are several other options here and I will let you play with those. But know that you can come here and ask Google to find any page and see what it looks like to Google. 
Next, let's look at our robots.txt tester. A robots.txt file is just a plain text file that lives in your home directory of your website. And in there, you can put instructions for search engines. I have an instruction of user agent asterisk, which means let everybody view my site. I also have one for disallow wp-admin, which means don't crawl that because it's admin. I don't want the world to see that. And then I have a link here to my sitemap. That tells search engines, hey, over here I have a map of my entire site and you can just read it and everything will work great. Here I can see my live one. It's just going to my site. I have zero errors and zero warnings. And I could, if I wish, rather than use the one on my website, edit this one and submit it and Google would use the one that I save right here. And right here, I can test a URL to see if it's blocked. So let's put in wp-admin. We'll search as Googlebot. And right there it says disallow. No, we can't do that. So you can build a robots.txt file right in here if you wish. If you're using a CMS, there are many plugins that can help you with your robots.txt that provide a tool in your admin area for building it without having to know all of the code and the details. So if you're using a CMS, I highly recommend that you look for a plugin to help with robots.txt. Next we come to sitemaps. I made reference to this in my robots.txt file. A sitemap is an XML file that lists everything in your site. My main one is made up of a list of more XML files. And this is what's in one. This is actually the browser rendering the XML file. And there's a link to WordPress plugins and screenshots. If I view page source, you can see all of this code. Now, my main sitemap file has all of these files in it, 139. I can assure you I did not code them by hand. I used a plugin for my CMS. Mine happens to be WordPress and I used the Yoast search engine optimization tool. But every CMS has a plugin that helps you make a sitemap. All it does is crawl your site and properly mark up your XML file to serve to Google. I submitted 1,443 pages and Google has only read through 1,365 of them. It was submitted on July 30th and processed on July 31st. So they haven't read through the whole thing yet. Now, of all the sites that I manage, mine is the only one that has bothered to do a sitemap at all. Which is surprising because it's ridiculously easy. I highly recommend it. Find your plugin, fill out a little form, it generates the sitemap for you, and it gives you a URL. Then you come to this page, click Test Sitemap, and it wants to know where it is. You tell it, and away you go. Google really likes sitemaps. It helps them know for sure everything on your site chances of failure are much lower. They prefer to crawl a site that has a sitemap. So I highly recommend that you get one. You can see errors and index errors, and I don't have any. And lastly, we're going to look at URL parameters. It says use this feature only if you're sure how parameters work. Incorrectly excluding URLs could result in many pages disappearing from search. We don't want that. So we go to learn more, and here's some more excellent documentation from Google. Now these three URLs all go to the same place on your site, but they have different parameters. So you can say to Google, these three pages are actually all the same content. Then Google doesn't slap you for having duplicate content on multiple pages. and you can see more accurate stats for that page, even though people are getting there via multiple URLs. But like it says, only use this if you're really sure how this works. 
In this video, we're going to take a look at the security issues and the other resources. The page for security issues is pretty boring right now because I don't have any, and nor do any of the sites that I have access to. However, they have some excellent material here on how to deal with it. Have you ever seen this right here? This site may harm your computer or this site may be hacked. And then maybe you see some of these kinds of things in your browser. Then it means your site was likely hacked and is likely hacked right now. Here's some more documentation from Google on how to deal with that. And some more. What's key is that this page is going to give you an enormous amount of information about the hack when you get hacked. Rather than just being told you may have been hacked, you can come here and it will tell you why Google thinks you've been hacked. It will say, hey, we found an additional 5,000 pages on your site today and they're all about pharmaceuticals. You might want to look into that. So pay attention to this page in particular. Check it often. The worst is when someone calls you and says, hey, I tried to go to your website, but Google says it may have been hacked. You don't want to be the last to know. You want to be the first to know. And checking this page early and often can help you know that. In another video, I showed you how you can set it up for Google to email you when something ends up on this page. You want to do that because you want to know immediately as soon as your site has been hacked. Under other resources, it's basically documentation for many of the things that we talked about. Here's the structured data testing tool. We talked about how you can put in some custom HTML to help Google better understand your website, to understand what it is you have, very specifically, right down to individual sentences. Here's the structured data markup helper. This is a point and click tool where you can say, I have restaurants or movies or software applications and you can put in a URL and you can start clicking on things in your site and it will tell you you should mark it up this way. The email markup tester, Google My Business. Remember that you can do specific things if you have a business like ratings on products. Google will help you mark up your business better. The Google Merchant Center allows you to upload product data, the things you have for sale, so that when you search for something, rather than clicking through to Amazon, Google results will say, hey, this person over here has it for sale. So your products can turn up immediately in Google results. Page speeds insights. Google can help you speed up your site. They can tell you, hey, this particular JavaScript file is loading super slow. You need to do something. Or this image never loads. Check it out. Custom search allows you to create a custom search field for your own site using Google. So people can go to your site, fill in a little search field, and search your site, but using Google. Google Domains is just a system for building your own website. I honestly don't recommend it, but it works. And it's pretty simple. And then there's the Webmaster Academy, which simply teaches you how to build websites. If you're serious about your search results, I highly recommend you go through most of these things because they're going to make your site better. They're going to make it rank higher. They're going to make Google like your site better. It'll help new data get into Google faster. Remember, the entire purpose of the Search Console is to help you and Google communicate with each other so that you can tell Google where your content is and they can tell you if there's any problems with it. The Google Search Console is free. There isn't a good reason to not use it. So go ahead and sign up today and it'll start collecting data immediately. It'll take a couple weeks to get really good data, but the longer it runs, the better the information you have.